Welcome. Welcome to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau's public meeting of the Community Bank Advisory Council, or the CBAC as we like to call it. My name is Zixta Martinez. I'm the Associate Director for External Affairs at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Today's public meeting is being held at the CFPB's headquarters in Washington, D.C. This is the CBAC's first public meeting of the year, and as always, we have a packed schedule. Today's public meeting is being recorded and will be available at consumerfinance.gov. You can also follow CFPB on Twitter and Facebook. Let me spend just a few minutes telling you about what you can expect at today's CBAC meeting. First, I'll introduce the Bureau's CBAC members. Then the CFPB's director, Richard Cordray, will provide opening remarks. Following the director's remarks, CBAC chair Tyrone Fenderson will resume his responsibility for conducting the meeting, and he will introduce Corey Stone, the Bureau's Assistant Director for Deposits, Liquidity Lending, and Reporting Markets. Corey Stone will provide an update on the Bureau's work on credit scores and credit reporting, and, will, and he will lead a discussion on that subject. The public meeting will adjourn at about 4.30. The Bureau established an advisory council with community banks from throughout the U.S., and the council has served the Bureau well. Our community bank advisory council advises the CFPB by sharing their unique vantage point as community banks in their unique relationship lending business model. The CBAC has provided substantive information, analysis, operational expertise, knowledge of community, and feedback that has better informed the Bureau's policy development, rulemaking, implementation efforts, and consumer engagement work. Today's public meeting and discussion is in support of this important responsibility. As a reminder, the views of the CBAC members or their views, they are greatly appreciated and welcome. However, they do not represent the views of the CFPB. So let's get started with an introduction of our CBAC members. I would invite them to raise their hand as I call them. The chair is Tyrone Fenderson. Tyrone is president and CEO of Commonwealth National Bank in Mobile, Alabama. The vice chair is Guillermo Diaz Rosalat. Guillermo is president and CEO of Continental Bank of Miami in Miami, Florida. Angela Bilkey is Vice President of the Mortgage Department at American Bank and Trust in Huron, South Dakota. Michael Gallagher is Senior Vice President and Chief Officer at Enterprise Bank in Lowell, Massachusetts. Donald Giles is President of Armed Forces Bank, Armed Forces Bank of California, and Academy Bank in Kansas City, Missouri. Joanne Murfeld is Senior Vice President of First National Bank in Mason City, Iowa. J. David Motley is president of Colonial Savings in Fort Worth, Texas. David Ringling is CEO of Sunrise Bank in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Fareed Tan is president and CEO of Metro City Bank in Doraville, Georgia. Monica Thomas is executive vice president of Illinois Service Federal in Chicago, Illinois. Catherine Underwood is President and CEO of Ledyard National Bank in Hanover, New Hampshire. And Tim Zimmerman is President and CEO of Standard Bank in Monroeville, Pennsylvania. We also have with us Delicia Hand, CFPB Staff Director for the Bureau's Advisory Board and Councils. I'm now pleased to introduce Richard Cordray. Prior to his current role as the CFPB's first director, he led the CFPB's enforcement office. Before that, he served on the front lines of consumer protection as Ohio's Attorney General. In this role, he recovered more than $2 billion for Ohio's retirees, investors, and business owners, and took major steps to help protect its consumers from fraudulent foreclosures and financial predators. Before serving as Attorney General, he also served as Ohio State Representative, Ohio Treasurer, and Franklin County Treasurer. Director Cordray.
Thank you, Zixta, and thank you to everyone both here and uh, on the web for joining our con Community Bank Advisory Council meeting. The council members share with us their perspectives on consumer financial issues and market conditions from experience with their own customers. This helps us fill a gap in our knowledge because we do not supervise any community banks with $10 billion or less in assets, and thus we lack day-to-day -day contact with their operations. The roots of my public service career were at the state and local level and were based on strong and lasting relationships within the community. Relationships of that kind depend on honesty and trust. That was especially true for me as a county treasurer and then the state treasurer because I was entrusted by the public to manage other people's money and keep it safe. People have to be able to trust their treasurer. I also worked with many community banks and I found that they operate on the same fundamental principles. I learned, and our Community Bank Advisory Council has reinforced the lesson, that their businesses are consciously built on treating their customers well, both in the short run and in the long run. Since we established this group three years ago, it's been a highly productive engagement. Council members share information not just about what they do, but how they do it. They inform us about the business practices that distinguish them as relationship lenders, and they share different approaches to serving consumers. These discussions help us understand the challenges and opportunities faced by community banks and how we can tailor our approach in considering the kinds of actions and policies we should be undertaking in response. Today we'll hear from some of our expert colleagues at the Consumer Bureau about the work we're doing on credit reporting and credit scoring. Then we will hear from our council members about how community banks use credit reports, often looking beyond the data to ensure products and services are appropriately tailored to their customers. We will also hear from council members how they often assist consumers in remediating and improving their credit lines. Before I turn the meeting over for those discussions, allow me to provide some brief background on the topic. Credit reports play an increasingly important role in the lives of American consumers. Most decisions to grant credit, including mortgage loans, auto loans, credit cards, and private student loans, include information contained in credit reports as part of the lending decisions. In a report we published in 2012, we showed that the credit reporting industry has profound effects on the ways and means of people's lives. For decades now, these effects have been positive in various respects. Most Americans have a credit file. In fact, each of the three biggest credit reporting companies maintain files on over 200 million consumers. People's ability to access credit and how much they pay for credit is typically governed by the information contained in their credit files. Without it, financial providers could not effectively assess and manage credit risk, and the supply of credit would be more erratic and more constrained. As the range and frequency of decisions that rely on credit reports have increased, so has the importance of assuring that these reports are accurate. Credit reports also have implications for smaller lenders and community banks. These institutions often engage in what is called relationship banking, which is based on more intimate and personal knowledge about their customers and local communities, rather than relying primarily on credit reports and other metric type data. Yet community banks are also consumers of credit reports and credit scores, and thus they're affected by inaccuracies in credit files as well. These are some of the issues our council members will be discussing with us today, and as always, the discussion will certainly improve our thinking and our work. So thank you again for joining us, and we look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Director Cordray, and uh, oops, I'm sorry. <laughs> Go ahead, Tyra. Uh, thank you, Director Cordray and Zixta. Uh, welcome to the first meeting this year of the CFPB's Community Bank Advisory Council. I'd like to welcome members of the public as well as the Advisory Council. The Bureau organized the Council in 2012 to have a means to hear from community banks all over the country, specifically because the Bureau does not supervise community banks of assets below $10 billion. To date, it has been a productive exercise and it has provided an opportunity for community banks across the country to alert the Bureau to specific circumstances and sets of issues facing community banks and the customers we deal with. During this afternoon's meeting, we will hear from the council members about credit scores and credit reporting and implications that arise for small financial institutions, particularly community banks. Credit reports play an important role in the lives of customers we serve. However, as relationship lenders, community banks look at, at the whole customer as we often meet the customers where they are. Today, we will hear from the Bureau staff, Corey Stone, 
the Bureau's authority in credit reporting as well as their research in the field. We'll then shift over to the discussion of the Council to get their perspectives on what some of the key issues are on community banks and where the Bureau ought to be focusing its attention. At this time, I'd invite you to ask, at any time, I'd ask you, invite you to ask any questions that may arise in order to help this be an interactive dialogue. So before we begin the discussion, I'll invite Corey Stone, Bureau Assistant Director for Deposits, Liquidity Lending, and R Reporting Markets to provide an update on the Bureau's work in this space. Corey? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, members of the committee and council for being here. Um, it's a privilege to uh, be able to speak with you and uh, really appreciate your uh, uh, time and uh, contribution to the work that we do here at the Bureau. Um, I'm going to speak about the way we think about the credit reporting market and the way the Bureau uh, has been interacting with it over the last few years and what our priorities are. Um, and we think about that market, uh, as I'll say more, as an ecosystem uh, where there are lots of participants uh, who have different roles uh, and who maintain a system on which we all depend. Uh, and that makes credit reporting a little bit different from some of the other products uh, that we oversee uh, in consumer finance, where there's a provider and there's a con on one end a consumer on the other. The consumer reporting system is a market uh, that has providers to businesses, and businesses are users, and businesses are also furnishers. And the consumer uh, who participates in the system uh, is affected by the decisions that all the other participants make. And that makes credit reporting uh, somewhat unique and also uh, something that everybody who is in the consumer financial marketplace has to pay some attention to uh, and appreciate. So I'm going to talk about uh, there we go. I'm going to talk about the importance of the system, uh, how the CFPB authorities uh, interact with it, uh, what we've done to date uh, and our accomplishments in this market, uh, what our priorities are, uh, and uh, some of the emerging issues. And then at the end, uh, we've put together some questions that um, probably will come up in the course of this presentation, but that we hope we can uh, elicit from you some important feedback that we will use in, in our own policy making and in our own efforts in this market. So uh, consumer reporting is, a, in some ways, the biggest market because just about every adult in the United States has uh, a credit report. Um, in our own uh, litmus test of what causes pain to consumers, the level of complaints that we get uh, in the marketplace is a good starting point. And we see in our consumer response statistics that credit report complaints generally uh, have been about a fifth of all the complaints that we get, third behind debt collections uh, and mortgage. Um, so it's a big deal for many consumers. Uh, it affects them uh, in many aspects of their lives. And uh, one of the things that's, I keep pushing the wrong button here. There we go. One of the things that's uh, uh, striking is that the majority, the vast majority of the complaints that we get in credit reporting are about accuracy, uh, about a credit report containing the wrong information or containing information that's incorrect. So it, here's our 2014 statistics, 77% uh, plus another 8%, which is about the fact that I submitted a dispute about accuracy and the investigation that the Consumer Reporting Agency uh, performed in that dispute was uh, 
uh, incomplete or inadequate somehow. So that's more than uh, four-fifths that are really in some way about the underlying accuracy or the information that you in the system have about me, the consumer, and, and about which um, uh, I have some important dissatisfaction. We follow up our consumer complaints by forwarding them to the provider, in this case we're forwarding them to the consumer reporting agencies, and we track those outcomes. And when we do, we see relative to other types of complaints that we field and that we forward to the, to the relevant entity, a very high level of relief. Uh, so just about a third of consumer reporting complaints have relief, given that the vast majority of these are about the information in the credit report. That means that about a third of the time, uh, the information is either being corrected or it's being removed from the credit report. That's, that's kind of how we would interpret relief in this particular type of complaint. Just to get a sense of the significance of this, when a consumer is complaining about inaccuracies, uh, we will not forward that complaint to the consumer reporting agencies until uh, the consumer tells us that they've already filed uh, the dispute that they're entitled to file under the Fair Credit Reporting Act. And the consumer reporting agencies, as you know, have the standard process where you can submit a complaint to them, and the consumer is also entitled to submit the dispute to the furnisher of the information and get it corrected in their obligations, which we'll talk about in a little bit about the, the kind of investigation that has to be undertaken. So this is the secondary complaint. These are the complaints about inadequate response. Uh, so the fact that a third of complaints where in an environment you would expect consumers often uh, want something to be true that's not true uh, are finding out that in fact their first inadequate response uh, was inadequate and that they're getting relief by using the Bureau as kind of this ele escalation point for their, for their complaint. Um, so there's what you would call in the quality control environment, kind of inadequate uh, quality control uh, and difficulty in detecting errors uh, and fixing them uh, that we see evident in our own, in our own complaint statistics. Um, this is a characteristic of an ecosystem that is really complicated. Um, we talk about uh, this being an ecosystem because uh, we have lenders who are users of credit reports, who are also furnishers of information. We have uh, the three nationwide consumer reporting agencies we have other consumer reporting agencies and other types of industries. We have some users who don't submit data. We have sources of data that are not users, principally the sources of public record information, which ultimately are the, the thousands and thousands of courthouses uh, in the country. And then we have the consumer playing a role. Um, it's a big system, so there are 200 million consumers, 200 million plus in the system. There are over 10,000 furnishers in the credit reporting system alone furnishing to each of the CRAs. Uh, and um, it's a concentrated market in the sense, at the same time, there are just these three CRAs in the credit reporting system. And if you look at the data in the system, half of it in terms of traditional trade lines uh, that consumers uh, uh, have with the various loans that they have come from the top 10 financial institutions. Uh, part of that reflects the fact that revolving credit accounts, principally credit cards, account for the majority of all of those trade lines, and that is a very concentrated industry. So you've got, you know, obviously the top 10 card issuers and bank cards representing 
um, over well over 90 percent market share in that in that market, uh, and those are very very big numbers. Um, accuracy is an important focus, and we'll talk more about it. Um, but we identified uh, early on in our history the key drivers of accuracy. There's um, the garbage in, garbage out problem, uh, or good data in, good data out problem, uh, which is how good is what the furnishers are providing. There is the ability of the consumer reporting agency to correctly match information that comes in with information about a consumer with the right consumer in their files, which is identified primarily by the same identifying information or related identifying information on the same consumers that come in from all the other furniture trade lines. You have to somehow take uh, all of the first names and all of the last names and all of the social security numbers and all of the dates of birth and match them in the right place into a coherent single uh, file that represents one consumer's history. And then the last driver of accuracy is the dispute process, which is where the consumer comes in, which is this is inevitably an imperfect system. There are always going to be errors in information. And uh, we give the consumer under the law the right to look at their report, uh, dispute uh, the, the, the information in the report, and, and impose an obligation uh, under our national system to investigate and correct it if it's wrong. We see high dispute rates where you would expect them in our market, and those have been an important focus. Debt collectors furnish information. It is almost uniformly negative when a debt collector is reporting information about you, uh, and so we would expect to see a high risk dispute rate about that information, and that's been a focus of our research. Public records are also generally negative information that, that impugn negatively on a consumer, and so we see high dispute rates in, in that area. Um, so that's our ecosystem. It's complicated. There are lots and lots of participants. Uh, there are people who are users who contribute, and there are free riders uh, who use it and don't contribute. Uh, and um, that adds to some of the complexity here. Um, all of this fits within a framework that Congress uh, defined for us in the Fair Credit Reporting Act and uh, in the implementing regulation V. Uh, this act was enacted in 1970. Um, um, most of you were probably not born then. Uh, I was. Um, I remember my high school history teacher actually giving an assignment on why the Fair Credit Reporting Act at was a good idea. Um, and uh, that was an era when electronic data systems were just coming into use in consumer reporting. It used to be a local business where uh, basically lists of who local merchants shouldn't accept checks from was the foundation. Uh, and then the industry grew from there as this was automated and then it became easier and easier to aggregate this kind of information in national databases. Because of the changes in the technology, Congress has seen fit to update this legislation at several important points, and particularly in uh, 96, 03, and then with the Dodd-Frank Act in, in 2010. Uh, they've recognized a lot of the developments and evolution of, the, of this market. Um, the Fair Credit Report Act defines the whole framework. It defines what a consumer report is and it defines what a consumer reporting agency is. And things become consumer reports in their use. I think that's an important concept there. A consumer report is information that's collected um, and assembled and evaluated for purposes of determining the eligibility of a consumer for something. It could be a loan. It could be uh, a rental of a housing. It could be insurance. It could be employment. Uh, to, to name the most important examples. Checking accounts is another. Um, and uh, in, in 
our lifetime, we've seen not just the evolution of the credit reporting system, but we've seen other kinds of, of consumer reporting systems evolve in some of these other markets as people have assembled databases of consumer information and started using them for eligibility. Uh, and the legislation that creates this framework has been remarkably flexible uh, and useful in encompassing all of these different kinds of uses of consumer information in the form of consumer reports, and uh, if you are a provider of consumer reports, that makes you uh, a consumer reporting agency. Um, it establishes a role for furnishers, all of the entities that provide information and establish obligations and responsibilities for furnishers. Uh, it defines the nationwide consumer reporting agencies that we know well, TransUnion, Experian, and Equifax, and it defines nationwide specialty consumer reporting agencies uh, that most consumers don't know about but can affect their lives very deeply in employment, tenant screening, insurance, uh, checking accounts, uh, and in some of the specialty credit markets. Uh, you are familiar with the FCRA. Uh, you can't not be uh, given your roles leading uh, the institutions that you lead, um, but it's worth kind of touching on what the, the key provisions are in the FCRA that, that work. The notion of permissible purpose uh, that you need in order to obtain a consumer report uh, is an important safeguard for consumer privacy. Um, there are particular restrictions in the use of, of consumer reports in employment screening and particular extra notifications and permissions that have to be given and obtained from the consumer. Uh, and then there are, there is the kind of notion in a, I guess a quasi-judicial sense of confronting the accused with the accuser. If there's an adverse action taken, uh, you get to know what, what report was contained in, you get to obtain that report uh, and find out what was the negative information that resulted in the decision. Uh, the CRAs have to enforce uh, a lot of these provisions uh, by determining that a permissible pur purpose exists. Um, they have to uh, obtain uh, the uh, they have to maintain the accuracy of the system, and there's this particular language of maximum possible accuracy that's contained in the FCRA uh, for us to go by. Um, there are restrictions on how long negative information can stay in reports, and the standard for most situations is seven years after which it needs to be dropped, and that's an obligation of the CRA. Uh, and then there are obligations to provide consumers with free reports in particular situations, notably adverse actions, and then when the consumer requests it once, once a year. And the three nationwide CRAs uh, are obligated to maintain a central source, uh, which supports annualcreditreport.com, uh, where consumers can go once a year and get their credit reports for free. Um, they also, as the CRAs, have to manage the dispute process. An important element of that is making sure that information about the consumer situation flows through them to the furnisher. Uh, and then the furnisher, in turn, has obligations uh, to not knowingly furnish inaccurate information, to investigate these disputes, uh, including use all that re relevant information in their, ob in their investigations. Uh, and they have to maintain uh, internal policies and procedures to make sure that, that data integ integrity is maintained uh, that is the basis for what they furnish. So this is a big deal. It covers, because of the ecosystem uh, that we're talking about and its breadth, it covers uh, many, many of the different kinds of, of participants that we supervise. So <laughs> supervision in this market has been uh, a very important focus of the Bureau uh, in our accomplishments to date. Uh, before we could supervise the uh, consumer reporting agencies directly, uh, making us the first federal agency to have supervisory authority over 
the consumer reporting agencies. Uh, we had to write a larger participant rule, and we did that in 2012. We began uh, our examinations of certain uh, CRAs uh, shortly thereafter, uh, focusing on particular practices and also uh, focusing on the complementary activities of furnishers. And we've found, um, as you might expect, uh, when a uh, market is new to this kind of regulation, findings uh, related to core aspects of compliance that we've discussed in our quarterly supervisory highlights related to compliance management systems, the oversight of compliance and visibility at the a CEO and board level, the degree to which policies are well documented, uh, complaints and dispute handling, uh, and other aspects of FCRA compliance, uh, and that uh, continues on an ongoing basis. We've issued specific bulletins. This is where we you know, find particular issues uh, that we want to call out for the marketplace and provide guidance uh, in a couple of important areas. Uh, one, early on, we found that these nationwide specialty consumer reporting agencies weren't consistently meeting their obligations to let consumer net consumers know where and how a consumer could obtain the annual report uh, that the consumers are entitled to. Uh, and we actually published the first list of nationwide consumer reporting agencies and where consumers could go as a result of that uh, and have shed some important light on a lot of these specialty markets. We've also focused on the investigation process, in particular the furnisher's obligation uh, to uh, use uh, and review all the relevant information that might be forwarded from the consumer through the CRA to them. Um, and that partly came out of a change that was uh, implemented by the three nationwide CRAs shortly after we issued uh, a white paper on the whole ecosystem uh, that allowed, in an automated way, the information that consumers uh, provide to the CRAs in the form of paper documentation or faxed or electronic documents uh, to have that forwarded to the, to the furnishers. Up until that point, it was reduced to just a uh, couple digit codes. So we've seen uh, uh, a, a vast increase in the amount of information that's going to the furnishers uh, a, and some uh, important changes in the quality of dispute handling as a result. We've had important uh, accomplishments in enforcement. Uh, I'll just talk about two. Uh, one related to the direct-to-consumer sale of credit monitoring service that many uh, card issuers um, sell as part of an add-on when they uh, book a new credit card account. Uh, we found in many cases uh, the, the disclosures and billing practices associated with these um, were uh, improper uh, and uh, very, very large sums uh, were uh, restituted to consumers as a result. Uh, we also uh, uh, closed a case with an auto lender called First Investors, uh, which was using a third party processor to uh, handle their information systems, uh, including uh, taking responsibility for the furnishing of information uh, where it was known to this lender uh, that that system was prone to errors and that inaccurate information was being furnished to the CRAs. Many lenders uh, use this particular system and so it was important for us to get out uh, a, a third party uh, a bulletin so that the market could know, including people who entrust their furnishing activities to a third party that, that uh, they ultimately are responsible for the quality of information that's being forwarded into, into our consumer reporting system. Uh, we've done a lot of research in this market. Uh, we are blessed with having uh, some uh, important data resources and also some uh, incredible intellectual capital like um, 
I'll point out my colleague, Deb Gordon, who's, who's out in the audience, although there's a name card for her here if she wants to, wants to come up. But Deb uh, is a veteran of uh, Fair Isaac, FICO, the credit scoring company, and um, brings lots of um, uh, knowledge. We also have um, brought from the Federal Reserve Ken Brevort, who is one of the leading scholars of the credit reporting system in the country to manage our data resources. We have a consumer credit panel, which is a nas national, nationally representative sample of consumer reports, all de-identified, that enable us to see how consumers are doing, how are they faring in the system, and to track them over time so that we can, we can see the impacts uh, of how an event that occurs at one point in their life uh, could have consequences down the road. It also allows us to really look at the quality of the data and the information that, that's here uh, in our system. We published a white paper just describing the system, which, you know, a level of detail and the drivers of actually, thanks for joining, Deb. Um, and we uh, have a couple of congressionally mandated reports that we had to issue as part of Dodd-Frank that were of concern with, that address concerns of Congress related to uh, credit reports and credit scores, in particular the differences between the credit scores that are sold as part of the credit monitoring services and the scores that lenders actually use, and we shed new light on the, on the differences where we found about a fifth of the time a consumer who buys a score through a credit monitoring service might see a significantly different score from what a lender might see. Uh, we've issued uh, data points in a white paper on medical debt and more broadly on the furnishing practices uh, of debt collectors, um, and that has been helpful uh, to SCORE developers in thinking about how to treat medical debt, and in fact, um, uh, one of the SCORE developers changed the way they weight medical debt in um, their consumer scores, and both FICO and Vantage Score uh, have removed from their scoring algorithms paid medical items because uh, uh, they were uh, less predictive uh, than other types of negative information uh, of future um, consumer defaults. Finally, we conduct a, a great deal of outreach uh, in this uh, system, partly to gather information, partly uh, to uh, engage with it and identify areas where uh, services can be improved uh, and where uh, we can help particular populations of, of people uh, who uh, have particular issues or concerns. Uh, a lot of these have to do uh, with uh, populations who have difficulty accessing credit, people who uh, have low incomes, people who are thin file or so-called thin file or no file consumers uh, who are outside of the credit system, how do we uh, get them in? Uh, we are concerned about people who are in financial distress and uh, some of you may have noted an announcement yesterday where as a result of uh, our calling attention to uh, a problem uh, industry has started fixing it. We noted that under the standard commercial contracts, credit counseling agencies who are typically buying a credit report and score for a consumer uh, aren't uh, able to share that information with their actual client. It's a kind of a strange uh, phenomenon. Um, that's just a result of the standard commercial contract, partly in order to protect the permissible purpose, limits who can see the report. Um, you can't just share, if you buy a report in somebody, you can't just share it with somebody else. Um, uh, FICO uh, renegotiated its licensing contracts with the three bureaus and announced yesterday that con counseling agencies who obtain FICO scores will be able to get those scores and FICO has also provided uh, additional content so that counseling agencies can interpret those scores. Uh, and Experian also announced that those um, uh, reports that they sell 
uh, can be shared by the counseling agencies uh, who buy them with their clients uh, in, in amendments that they will make to their contracts directly with those agencies. And we're urging TransUnion and Equifax to, to follow suit. Uh, so that's some of the, the work that we've been doing. Uh, final area in, in sort of this general credit reporting area, final area where we've been active is looking at the specialty consumer reporting market affecting checking accounts. Um, where we've been concerned about uh, the data integrity in that market and also uh, the way in which that data is used, uh, trying to make it possible, uh, as much as possible, for consumers who've had difficulty maintaining checking accounts, and we're not talking about the fraudsters who try and intentionally uh, beat the bank, which we talked about in the Deposits Committee this morning, uh, but the, the people who genuinely um, went negative uh, because of overdrafts and struggling and couldn't repay and had their accounts closed and end up with a, with a, a negative uh, mark in their uh, consumer file and the specialty uh, consumer reporting agencies in this market can reestablish themselves uh, at the same bank, have the ability to repay, have that information updated, uh, but also where there are safe products for them. And consumer reporting figures in this sort of larger question of, of access to uh, checking accounts. Going forward, um, we've been pretty clear about our priorities. Uh, accuracy is number one uh, at the furnisher level uh, in the oversight and general quality control and measurement of accuracy uh, at the CRAs, uh, particular focus on understanding better the very, very complicated task of matching uh, billions of, of updates and records that come in uh, each month um, and the dispute handling that is kind of the back end uh, catch for, for errors in the system. We're also focused on the interactions that consumers have with the uh, consumer reporting agency, uh, not just in the dispute process, uh, but in getting access to the actual reports and scores that are, that are in the information, uh, partly uh, making sure that consumers uh, fare well and can get their reports um, reliably through annualcreditreport.com, partly uh, by encouraging um, the very positive development of institutions sharing uh, credit reports and credit scores in particular. Most credit card issuers are buying a score each month to monitor accounts to share that information with uh, the consumer. Uh, and that really has taken off uh, uh, very much uh, thanks to a combination of FICO's uh, innovation and our own strong push uh, in that market. Uh, and we continue to look at the paid subscription consumer monitoring service uh, where uh, products are being sold for a fee and making sure that that's working fairly. Uh, Finally, the whole process of, of, of disputes and error resolution is, is an important focus going forward. In our research, uh, we continue to look at medical debt. Uh, we will be focusing uh, increasingly on public records information, which is in the credit reports of about 12 percent of consumers. Uh, we are focusing on uh, data that isn't contained in the credit reporting system that can be used for credit underwriting to the benefit of consumers' access. We've got, um, uh, we'll have actually more information on this, but you know, well over 40 million consumers uh, who are outside, adult consumers who are outside the credit reporting system today, uh, but who have other opportunities to demonstrate their credit worthiness by making payments on rent, on telecoms, on utilities, and that's an important set of alternative data that we are uh, looking at as something that could be uh, organized. And there have been innovations uh, announced by uh, some of the CRAs and SCORE developers in this area. We're looking also at the technology that is involved in underwriting and in bringing data to underwriting decisions and the phenomenon of what's called big data which is uh, looking at the almost infinite number of unstructured data elements that exist in the Internet about each and every one of us uh, that could be used to say something about this. 
it's got some upsides, it's got some risks. On the upside, if you don't know anything about me, but I have a big footprint on the internet, maybe you can learn enough uh, from that footprint to make a good underwriting decision about me and they give me access to credit. On the other hand, when you are using that information, uh, that information may contain things that typically we wouldn't allow to be used or we wouldn't want to be used, both for privacy reasons and for discrimination reasons. So um, that's, that's a piece of this. Um, an additional complication is the fact uh, that a lot of the models that drive algorithms from these thousands and thousands of data elements that you could construct a model around are built by machines rather than people because a human can't build a model with thousands of elements by themselves. They need a machine to do it. And when a machine does it, it really doesn't know what it's doing. It doesn't know why it's predictive. It just is. Um, and that raises the problem, A, of if things change in the market for safety and sound re soundness reasons, you would really want to know what's changed in the market and why something that was predictive today isn't going to be predictive tomorrow. Uh, but you also want to know um, when you're using factors that, while they may be predictive, they may be something that we would prohibit if we actually use them uh, in a cre credit report uh, or in, a, in, in an under underwriting decision, you know, such as race, religion, age, things like that, or proxies for things like that that, that show up in, in the internet. So those are some of our focuses um, up until this point. And uh, we uh, want to hear, given the framing that, that we've provided to you today about the way we think about and look at this uh, complicated system, how it affects you, how you interact with it, um, what are the benefits and challenges that you derive from it. Uh, I've come with some specific questions that maybe can tee off our conversation today, um, and I'll just say them here, and I'll turn it over to uh, our chairman and vice chairman to uh, maybe lead this discussion, and Deb and I will be here as resources, but um, one simple one is in what ways is the way you as community banks interact with them uh, with the system different from the way a large institution would interact with it? Uh, what are the specific challenges uh, that you experience as a user and as a furnisher? Um, when you're underwriting, when do you use the system and then when do you go outside the system? When, are the, when for consumer loans or for small business loans that rely on consumer information, are you using other kinds of information? What kind of information is that? Um, and likewise, with scores, are you using the, the kind of standard bureau credit scores or other kinds of scores and underwriting algorithms? Um, how do you interact with the people outside of the system, the thin file, people who have a little bit of information but not enough to derive a score, or the no file, the people who don't even show up in, in credit reports? How do you extend lending opportunities to them or respond to them when they come to you and apply for a loan? Uh, what kind of on-ramp do you provide to these folks uh, as community banks? And then finally, for people at the other end of the, of the process, we've got um, you know, about a third of adults with one or more collection items on their reports. Uh, a large portion of those have scores that you would list as subprime. You might not uh, at first blush want to extend credit to them, but they want to have opportunities to restore their credit worthiness and re-enter the credit system. What role is, do you provide as community banks uh, to help them restore their credit and how does that interplay with this ecosystem that we've been talking about? So with, the, with that, I turn it over to uh, our chair and vice chair. Uh, Corey, thank you very much for that very insightful sort of background and understanding how the Bureau has uh, delved into a very complex uh, and longstanding re reliance that we have on credit reports and scores. 
uh, obviously the uh, credit reports and scores that we rely on have broader implications for Americans across the country. Uh, specifically, it determines how much life costs in many cases for the consumers that we serve. Uh, you raise very interesting uh, and provoking questions that I open up to our colleagues to, to chime in on. I, I think it's important that we provide this feedback and I open it up to, the, to my colleagues. Tim. I'll lead off here, Corey. Uh, one of the things, the first question is, is interesting when it actually provides an opportunity to explain uh, the differences in approach with, uh, with the community bank, the credit score, we use them, but it's, it's just part of the decision. Uh, we don't we don't look at that number and then make a de make a credit decision on whether somebody will get credit or not and we're trying to look at the whole picture because it's our the community banking business is a relationship based business where uh, in many times we have a lot of other information about the applicant that we because we know we either know the applicant we know the family we look at factors like in a loan situation loan to value debt to income all and we try to look at the whole picture of a consumer and specifically on the credit report if there are items on there, we're talking to the customer about those items. We don't just look at the report and say that's an end-all, be-all. If there's something on your report that's derogatory, we're going to ask you about it. Why is it there? Is it accurate? So, so the consumer is going to get a chance right at the point of application to discuss these things that are on their report. And many times if they tell us this is why this happened, this is the situation, they, they tell us the story, and if it's a, if it's a persuasive uh, type of thing, that's going to get – uh, considered in the overall underwriting decision. So I, th I think uh, that that interactive process between the customer and the financial institution, in this case the community bank, is, is very important. And uh, since we use the system and we actually furnish information to the system, we know that it's not perfect. We know that it's not infallible. And so we always have that in the back of our mind. And again, in a, in a lot of cases, we try to put the shoe on the other foot, say if we were in that situation, we want to have the opportunity to explain why a certain situation exists. So I think, um, I think it's, it's part of what we use, but it's clearly not something that we just look at and then move on and that decision has been made. Uh, let me add to that from an, an anecdotal um, story of how we use at our bank the credit reports. First of all, it's, we re consider it a mystery. Uh, sometimes we see good credit scores and <laughs> and then we dig into it, and we see all sorts of bad credit into it. And conversely, we see uh, bad credit scores, and you, you question it because it has a good, you know, recent credit history. So we really have to drill in, and we like to see, from our end, we like to see trends. If you see that the credit is uh, uh, going uh, down, then that's something that we will be looking into it. And we have that conversation. We also know that Consumers sometimes have tough times, and we give them a, a, a chance to get their, their life back. If we see that it's far removed and they may have had a, a problem, we would always, always extend a hand out to, to them. Kathy. Um, I would say exactly what we just heard from the other two in that the report and the score are really just parts to the puzzle and we really need to see the whole story and we do take into consideration the client and their life experiences you know many of our community banks are in rural markets where they've operated for generation after generation after generation and and we know families we know where these folks work we know their employer um, it it makes it a bit easier to work with them and also it really is our responsibility to work with them and to help them and if we have a um, borrower who has had an issue or an event in their life understanding what that event is is important and if all the other factors are <clears throat> strong um, then we can overlook what happened I'll give a very quick example of a loan we made just recently of an individual who had a terrible credit score and a terrible credit report because she'd had a medical emergency. And uh, the request was to make a manufactured home loan to get her out of a high paying rent property into a, an affordable manufactured home. It made sense for her, it saved her $400 a month. So we understood the medical emergency, we understood that this was in the best interest for this 
lady, single lady, and so we, we made an exception to our policy and uh, made the loan. But there are times that you know we have fourth generation coming in that doesn't have the credit report, and that's where our responsibility is to help them build it. And we do that all the time, whether it's making a CD secured loan to let them establish credit, um, making a small loan against the truck, you know, to get them accustomed to making monthly payments, building a credit score, and um, these are the things that we do every day with our clients. Just to follow up on that, is, it, is the auto loan a kind of important entry product for your customers generally who, when they haven't been in the system? Is that might be frequently the first loan that you would offer? I think it is the first loan that that, gener that age group is looking mm -hmm. for, whether we're the ones that deliver it. Um, there's a lot of competition in that space. <laughs> <laughs> right. Monica. Um, I wanted to piggyback on what she said. We um, often, we have designed loan products that give our customers the opportunity to repair um, and build up a better credit history. Um, we tie it to um, savings vehicles, so you make a small loan. The proceeds of the loan we put into a savings vehicle as they begin, and we give them probably a two-year term to pay that back, and if they have good, consistent payment history, that impacts a positive credit profile, and then at the end they have a savings. Um, I would say that um, uh, most uh, community banks do not use automated underwriting systems uh, for their decision making on consumer installment loans, uh, especially consumer credit. Um, so um, that's one of the vehicles that we are able to work with our customers and determine the reasons for why a credit score might be low. Um, I think that uh, some credit, there's a lot of reasons for a low credit score. Sometimes it's because maybe they co-signed a loan for someone else, a son or daughter or something, and then their child then um, um, didn't make it, make a payment on time. Um, and so that impacts the co-signer's score as well. And they may have had to come back in and, and make a payment, but maybe they didn't make the payment for that cosign loan until after it was already delinquent and it shows up on their score. Once it's there, it's there. Um, so that that would be a situation where we would we would consider that some extenuating circumstances. Um, the other thing is sometimes you have very, very small um, uh, delinquent uh, amounts of credit that might be delinquent. I, I don't know how FICO uh, scores are calculated, whether they consider if it's a $10 payment that's late or a $400 payment that's late. I don't, I don't know how that is calculated in the system um, and how that impacts a score, but I, I think that's something to look at as well. Also, I think with the amount of student loan debt that's out there, um, frequently you have um, individuals who are having to start repaying those loans. Um, and I think sometimes you have uh, uh, young people getting out of school, uh, getting to the part where they have to start repaying those, those loans. Uh, maybe their income isn't quite up to where they need it to be in order to make those payments, or they're not quite in the, in the system of being able to get in the habit of how they're gonna make those loans. All of a sudden it's delinquent and they need to get an automatic deduction set up and, and, and those kinds of things. Um, uh, so I, I think there's a lot of extenuating circumstances that can happen that can impact a score where, but these individuals, when we work with them, we determine that they're a good credit risk. And so that we can, we can work with them and, and, and uh, give them credit um, and then have it be a successful relationship. Angela. One of the things we can do as a community bank as well is when you do find that there is a problem on the credit report that's incorrect or they did have a problem and they took care of it and it's not been reported correctly yet on the credit bureau, we can get that proof and make the loan without that be correction being made on those credit bureaus first. So that's a big help for a lot of people because it takes a long time. I have sat and done letters with people to help them correct their reports and it's a process to get that correction done. Or if it was taken care of to get the, the showing that it was taken care of. That could be 60, 90 days easily. You know, I would say that, that it is somewhat of a consensus around the table that we don't 
solely rely on credit scores as a means to make a credit decision. Uh, I, however, I would ask ourselves if you believe with me that what we're really doing is, is helping to prepare a consumer to be able to borrow from somewhere else or improve their lives, frankly. Because we look beyond the credit score as a decision point, primarily. But if we help them get into a vehicle that is uh, as a furniture of credit reporting data, uh, then they're, and they pay it responsibly like we believe they will, then their scores improve. And if their scores improve, the broader implications I mentioned earlier, uh, they can maybe improve their housing situation. Uh, they may be in, able to improve their employment situation. Uh, they may be able to lower their borrowing cost at other places. So in theory, we are, uh, we are, are taking the risk to allow them to maybe go on and, and not bank with us, but, but we, we think the relationship does matter and, and there are some loyalties uh, that go along with that. Uh, so I think it would suffice to say that, that as a user of the information, you know, we sort of use it to understand, but, but credit reports um, don't lie. Credit scores don't necessarily tell us the full truth. David? Thank you. Maybe, um, and I would agree with Ty what Tyrone said and what everybody, it's less about the score and more about the actual history. Um, and even for us, it's more about what's happened in the last 12 months. What, what does that payment history look like in addition to those public records, um, the bankruptcies, the levies, the judgments? Um, maybe to take a little different tact in regards to maybe some more technical feedback. Um, so Sunrise reports at the moment just to one agency. Um, and as well as we receive information from one agency, and we're about to expand that to all three, um, we find that the systems, um, Metro 2 and the eOscar system are the two kind of big primary ones, um, are good but cumbersome to work with. Um, as I kind of pulled my staff, uh, the word, boy, these are a beast, kind of came around a few different times. So I don't know exactly what that means, but it, they didn't say simple, easy, convenient, and fast. Um, Sorry, D David, are you using um, a core processor to kind of do that, assemble those files for you, or are you c constructing the Metro 2 files yourself? Um, I believe we're constructing them ourselves. Okay. Whether we use our core processors, Pfizer, in addition to that, I don't know. I'd have to okay. double check on that one. Um, you know, it, it, to put some perspective to this from a bank our size, about $800 million, um, our disputes with the credit bureaus that we receive are about eight to ten a year. So, you know, w when you're looking at the grand scheme of things, we're, it's zero, essentially. It, it's very, very small. Um, we do have access for people to have CD secured loans to do that credit builder. We also have uh, access uh, for all our customers as well as our employees to a financial budgeting and counseling. So if, if they're in a spot where it's more than just the credit bureau situation or that situation is really indication of a greater problem. Um, it's, it's a longer term solution than just, hey, this is a mistake. Then we have some reference to budgeting and counseling to help work out of that in a long term way. Um, the other thing that I would say is we have looked at, uh, and I would say look at fairly loosely, but um, a little bit of research in the alternative credit bureau space. Again, we're working in low and moderate income communities primarily. And so we're curious as to, you know, how does payment on phone records and rent and other alternative sources really reflect maybe a, a better way uh, this person's ability to repay uh, or their willingness to repay um, than either maybe a few blemishes on their credit bureau or no credit at all, that thin file that you talked about. You've, you've been experimenting in that area or you're looking for uh, we're, we're looking at or? we've looked at three different options and um, one recently that uh, came to light was they have a process up and running and they're using uh, electrical bills rent cell phone bills um, and what they're saying at the end is listen if you have this type of rating a B or C you could get this type of credit you could actually get access to an auto loan um, this price might be higher if you're a C-rated credit than an A, but, but you can actually get, um, I'd still like to see some proof. I don't know if that's going to meet our regulator test at all. Um, so it's, uh, it's one that I'm curious about. Um, I see things, especially in, in low and moderate income communities, that um, 
people might have been got into a situation that they could partially control or they have a blemish on their credit bureau because of a relative that they tried to help out and it doesn't really reflect um, kind of their day-to-day -day, um, payment activity because we can see it through the checking account but that checking account isn't that isn't a credit file either from that standpoint um, so we're trying to blend a little bit more data together to get a maybe a holistic profile I'd like to circle that back to the kind of general theme of the way in which community banks at least here know their customers uh, in a different way and David you mentioned the regulator I one of the things that we learned in this morning's uh, committee meeting was that at least the consensus estimate among the community banks participating was that uh, of the involuntary closures uh, of checking accounts um, 50 percent of those uh, are caused by divorces don't know whether that statistic holds up in a truly scientific way, but it, it would suggest, you know, there's a place where local knowledge uh, actually is a great advantage in being able to determine uh, which spouse uh, was the one who let the account go and who's kind of the, the victim in this, in this particular case and uh, kind of n not quite worry about the fact that both have, have blemishes uh, in the, at the CRA. But kind of in the discretionary kind of underwriting that that David you're talking about where you, you know you would know something outside of the credit report about the situation of the consumer Joanne you mentioned the students situation you know where you would know something about the employer and and so forth um, are there regulatory constraints to using that kind of information uh, in underwriting? Is that, uh, is that a concern, David? Um, you know, I, I, would, I wouldn't say it's not a concern. I would say that we're going to try to document the file to justify the decision, um, which sounds simple, but it's really maybe not as simple as you may think. We really want to make sure that that file points to, hey, this is – these were these blemishes. Here's what we think of the data. We're really going to have to justify our answer if we're really going outside of our policy and our credit box, because um, not only our board is going to ask that question, but the regulator is going to pull that file. Um, so we got to be ready. I, I would like to say that they say, "Oh, you know, your judgment has been good in the past, and these are small loans," but that, that's not the way it's happening at the moment. That would also include some concern regarding fair lending and the approach to ensure that that you have documented your files well enough to justify the loan decision I would suggest though that that relationship is a documentable event I mean and and if there is a borrower an applicant that comes to a, a financial institution who has blemishes and they are a new customer or a new prospect to you it's much different much more difficult to do that because there is no experience there there is no relationship there therefore it is difficult to make those uh, and in fact, if someone is coming to you and not going to their regular bank, uh, that may be one of the red flags we all sort of observe, right? I mean, just on that note, I think it's important. Yes, it is a little bit more work, but it is possible. So you got to go the extra mile. And so, you know, your bankers may complain, you know, it's, this is difficult work. Yeah, it is, but it's for the right cause and it's for the right reason. It's for the people in our community. So get it done. But it has to be done right. Because if you mess up right. and a bad credit, you're going to hear from the board onto the regulator. So that is a, a roll of the dice that you have to take and you have to take with caution. I have a suggestion too. Uh, that, uh, I think uh, you have really good goals in terms of uh, improving the accuracy and, of course, getting better consumer access and things like that. But on the accuracy point, I think all of us would be feel really more a lot more comfortable with the information that came from the credit reporting agencies if they were held to the same standard as we are on uh, Hamda and things like that, so that uh, you know you know we'd be <laughs> zero tolerance. <laughs> zero tolerance. <laughs> this really does feel to me like it's a great example of the whole issue of relationship banking. You've got a possible transaction, you've got a metric that you could simply rely on. If you did that, you'd be no different than any other institution that might know nothing about the customer or the community. Uh, you have more to go on. 
uh, and you feel confident you've you've done this time and time again you've got experience with sizing up uh, your customers and knowing them well and we we all should want you to simply document that into the file and make your best judgment and we want to give you room to do that it is it is fascinating because the the numerical kind of kind of crude impersonal information itself potentially causes some reason to be um, to shake your confidence in your judgment or to potentially suggest that there's some countervailing factor that somebody reviewing the transaction might see uh, but this is exactly what community banking seems to me to be about uh, and and the fact that you don't simply rely on the number but you think more broadly about the consumer situation is exactly what we should want you to do. Uh, you've shown your success over many years and many institutions at doing that and we should want to encourage that. So, so it's a very interesting example of some, uh, some of the things that we've all seen and, and thought about uh, in terms of what makes community banks different from uh, other financial institutions. Corey, you had mentioned in uh, one of your bullet points just in regards to access to checking accounts as a, one of the sub-items that you're looking at as well. Um, we do use check systems, which I think has changed their name to Qualify, but I'm not sure that I, it's always check systems in my it's head. It's the name of their product. It's the name of their product, okay. Um, and, and we do use that and we do um, look at that. There's actually a, a Minnesota state statute that if um, uh, if certain records are are on check systems that we're are really are not allowed to now we're a national bank so we could probably preempt that but we do follow that statute um, but we do work with those clients to try to resolve those issues um, we also offer a savings account as kind of a substitute for that as well as um, access to a general purpose reloadable card if they need a transaction type of a, a product um, and, and we do not require check systems for a, a GPR card um, because it is, you really cannot overdraw that particular product. Um, so there are barriers or gateways, and we try to provide as much access to accounts um, and payment systems as we can, um, particularly for the communities that we serve. It's an avoidance of um, check cashing fees, payday lending, and so forth, alternative products that are higher cost. Michael. Corey, one of the challenges that we see um, we are primarily a commercial bank, and when we go to report to the credit reporting agencies, we don't always report the information on small businesses. So a lot of times there's a blurred line between the individual and the small business. So when we are underwriting those loans or reporting those loans, there's, there's probably not as much information as we would need to get a full understanding of the full relationship so would would look for you to consider that another area that is not on your list but probably is very important to all of us is uh, many of our employees were running credit checks and it's very important that we have full knowledge about the people who are working for us you're talking about the what using credit reports to screen them when you hire them or are you talking about knowledge about the way they're using credit reports in their jobs. I'm sorry. I it's actually when we hire our people. Got we're, it. we're running credit checks on bankers. Got it. Yeah. The Bureau shared earlier in one of maybe committee discussions the idea of uh, increasing uh, the opportunity for consumers to shop. Uh, for example, <coughs> uh, for an auto loan uh, usually a consumer goes into the dealership and they get offered a loan. Uh, an inhibitant to a consumer shopping is the number of inquiries that are used in order to evaluate credit because it lowers their score uh, a part, as a part of that process. Uh, Joanne mentioned a minute ago she didn't really know what was in, in the formula for the credit score. I am excited that Deb Gordon is here with the secret envelope. <laughs> I have to be very careful. I have to be somewhat careful because some of the fight goes in the audience. Um, 
the FICO, FICO score does allow for a shopping period, a 30-day shopping period for auto, student loans, and for mortgage. So you can develop as many inquiries as you want during that period. It'll count as one. There's also a 15-day period following that in which it's deduped. So let's say you're looking for a mortgage and you've made an inquiry three weeks ago, but you've gone back and they've pulled you again. They will dedupe that. It'll still only count as one. So, little secret sauce. <laughs> <laughs> Say again. Even if that's a uh, if it is a new company outside of the 30-day, that would count probably as two. But if it is the same company going back and doing a recheck on you because it's been three weeks later, then that will count as one. It's a dedupe. But I think if it's it, in the algorithm, if it's a different company within the shopping period, sort of by definition, it wouldn't affect your score. It would still be counted as one. Yeah, within 30 days, everything is one for those three products. Deborah, do you know how soft pulls work when you're doing a QC on an, on any of these? Because, you know, it can be a year later and you're getting a QC report and they're pulling soft pulls on them. Does that count as an inquiry? No, no. Soft, soft pools are not. not um, part of the, the beauty of the open access program is that the uh, credit card lenders that are offering it uh, are pulling these records from the credit bureau every month and offering it on the consumer's statement. There is nothing that impacts the score there. Those are all soft inquiries. Many of us have been in situations where a young uh, applicant has walked into the bank that has no credit file and walked in with your best customer who wants them to stand on their own two feet and to earn uh, everything that they get. Uh, and in those thin, thin file or no file situations, uh, I'm sure we all approach those in different ways. I'd invite my colleagues to sort of comment on that. I might comment on that. In our, in our wheelhouse, we, hit, we get a lot of uh, younger folks uh, applying for loans and we've created over the years uh, uh, what we call star loans. Uh, uh, we're part of the FDIC small dollar loan program back in 2004 and it was real successful and we've worked with regulator uh, to continue to grow that. We also have a starter credit card for people who have no file or a thin, or a thin file and, that, and then after a period of either six months or a year then they can graduate into a, a different type of loan and it's been real successful for us since, uh, since we've done that. Fareed? There's a unique situation where you are dealing with an uh, immigrant community where, where they come here, they have cash in a pocket, but by the time they walk into a car dealership, they pull the credit, there's no record at all, there's no credit. It's because some of this customer is cash-based transaction. So we, we are in a unique situation where like piggyback what some of the council members say is that we have to help them to create a credit. <laughs> and so the system itself is relying so much on credit score in such a way that our customer has to come to us to build a credit. So basically we are helping this uh, consumer to build a credit so that they can go somewhere else. <laughs> so. I mean, we are in a unique situation where, where immigrants come in with cash in the pocket but there's no credit. Or they have a card that is secured by CD, but they pay every month in full. There's no credit history. So, so we are in a unique situation where we are helping all this immigrant community to build credit. And when by the time their credit is good, they go away. <laughs> so this is one of the experience that we have that uh, in, in our service area that we are servicing. Yeah. I'm curious if that is uh, a general catch-22 that others find. That, you know, you are a logical point of entry for consumers into the system, but once they're in the system, they become poachable. Uh, you know, by direct marketers or indirect lending at dealers where you, you uh, have essentially free riders on your, your front end work. Is that, is that a common experience? However, if we, do, if we do a really good job when we're working with them, there should be some kind of 
loyalty or thankfulness for what we did too. Yeah. So, uh, and, and again, if our business is building relationships, here's the very starting point of the first relationship. And a lot of times in our cases, and like I know at my bank, if we do that for someone, we've got a customer for life because we believe in them. And they, they come in there a thin file, but we, there's things you can look at. Do they have a job? You know, how much are they making on this job? And by interviewing them and talking with them, you can get an idea about what kind of person they are, you know, how, how seriously they take their obligations, particularly if you have somebody there, a younger person who has a degree and doesn't have any student debt, that's pretty good. You know, there's something something pretty good happened there, and you want to find out why that is, and then you go on from there. And so there's other things you can look at to still make a good decision, make a good credit decision, and help that person out. So I, I think uh, I, I'm not so worried about you're going to lose some, of course. They're going to leave the area and things like that. But in terms of going someplace else, I like to think that if we do the kind of job we should do, um, we, we've got them. Deborah. I, I'd like to make a statement. Um, the community bank environment in the U.S. is probably supports one of the greatest consumer advantages and, and benefits that they could possibly have. There are so many consumers that are emerging into the market, uh, trying to establish themselves, immigrating into the market, and the large players do not have the time or wherewithal or capability to be able to independently and carefully evaluate their credit. And so you provide a service that's absolutely immeasurable. That's one of the basis why community banking is a backbone in this country. Uh, you have to play the same regulatory game. You have to justify all of your actions. You have to prove that uh, going outside of your policy was a good decision and you document that well to make sure that the, all of that's there. But I, I will s confirm what you're saying, Timothy. If you give these opportunities to people, more often than not, you have a consumer for life. You have a customer for life. But, but one of the experience that we face is that we have to walk a fine line on the fair lending. Okay, because if you give customer A with, with no credit, with $5,000 loan, and next customer walk in, and you do not know that customer, you might walk into a fine line that you're violating a fair lending. So everyone has to be very careful about that because you know A, you give $5,000 because we know the relationship banking. Maybe we know he's so-and-so relative, we know he's a good customer base and true experience. But then there's another customer, B, you walk into the, to the shop, we do not know them. So then you walk into a fair lending situation where regulator come in looking at a law, you say, why this loan was rejected, this loan was approved. So has to be very careful even you document it properly. So that's what fair lending is sometimes we get into issue with fair lending because of that. We had a similar issue on our side as well from a fair lending perspective. We have a very large Portuguese and Cambodian community outside of Boston, and because of their lack of credit history, we were finding that we were denying more loans proportionate to the population in the community, and we were cited for that. Um, one area that I know is important for you, and um, I think, Donald, you touched on this, um, Michael, you definitely touched on it, is just the overlap between the consumer credit and small business credit and the, um, I mean, there's a synergy there. The small business loan re relies on underwriting on the character of the proprietor. Um, can you talk more about how your small business loans do and don't rely on the consumer credit reporting system? Uh, what are the other sources of information you use? And um, likewise, when might you be using business information to make a consumer loan to the proprietor? Obviously, when their income derives from the business, that's important. But um, it's something that we ha have an interest in understanding uh, a bit more. Uh, in, in almost all cases, 
small business owner and the consumer that are one and the same overlap. Uh, as, a, a, as an underwriter of a small business credit, we are going to evaluate the principles behind it because we need to understand what their obligations are because they, they do walk in tandem in most cases. And as much as a small business is sometimes funded by the consumer credit card, uh, and the need for the individual behind the business will impact the ability for the business to service its debt. As such, you know, we rely heavily on the consumer credit report as a way to identify existing debt, uh, the monthly obligations in order to calculate what the overall debt obligations are for a particular borrower that then translate to, you know, how it fits into the overall debt service coverage ratio for the small business. Uh, so we look at small business credits more as uh, as proprietors because they do overlap and they're, they're almost seamless in most cases. But, but another aspect of that is that because it's a small business, there's some kind of, hopefully, they're generating some kind of income. And what we we're, we're like we look at those as cash flow based loans at our bank, and so we do exactly what Tyrone is describing. We look at the credit report to see what the global uh, a credit situation might be, but then on the on the loan on the business loan itself, we're saying if there's any history on it, let's look at the financials for the business and see what kind of uh, cash flow it's generated. Does it have the ability to repay the loan on what they're trying to do if they're expanding the business or something like that? If it's a brand new business, it's much more difficult. Then I think you're relying a lot more on the the, the borrower's prior history and what their credit report is, so uh, credit score is and things like that, So because you don't really have much else to go on. They have a proposal and they have the brilliant idea, but now you have to try to figure out if it's going to work or not. It's much easier on an established business or a business that's been out there for a while. We rely more on what the business is doing in that case and probably less, unless it's a terrible credit score, of course, there's some reason for that. Otherwise, uh, the business drives the decision on that side more than on the consumer side. You know, we talked earlier about how much we use the credit reports only as one piece. We'll use tax returns, financial statements, collateral values, whatever we can get our hands on. In addition to that, for some of the small businesses, they also report on Dun & Bradstreet. So we'll pull a report through them to get whatever information we can. Plus, social media is becoming more and more important that we can glean the information about the business, about the reputation that we combined in the files. And I would just add on to that, um, we don't use, uh, uh, well, I should say we use in addition to that for maybe some of our little bit larger commercial credits, which still isn't large relative, to, I mean, you might think of a loan that's five million and five to ten million dollars, um, do a Troy report, which is a little bit more in-depth um, view in regards to that particular business owner and that business anything from litigation to uncovered lawsuits, what the details are of them, that are, you know, are they specific? Um, is, are there things, they go a bit deeper than what a credit bureau will, sh will show. David, you said earlier you saw eight to 10 disputes a year. I, th I think that was the number. I just am curious uh, about dispute volumes that you receive as furnishers and are, are your experiences similar to that, and, and what's your experience both as uh, recipients and, and as investigators and users of the eOSCAR system when you're providing information back to a consumer reporting agency or taking a direct risk dispute from a consumer? You know, I would say we're going to be very similar to David at 8 to 10 or so. And the disputes that you hear, that would be the ones of us reporting out. And so those will be fixed in a day, I can call directly, they can call me, I call directly to the report, get it fixed for them, get a new report ran the next day, not a problem. Um, if that we find, otherwise if it isn't correct, it's a dispute, but it's a correct uh, report, then of course we would respond that way, but those are very quickly done. Mm -hmm. When we are trying to help the customer get something else done, that's an issue. Like I said, I've been involved with writing letters to TransUnion, we've done website disputes, I've tried to help customers. And the thing is, is that they get 30 days to respond. Well, you only report like on a 30 day basis as a, as a uh, institution, and so that's 30 days. So then that took 30 days, it's another 30 days to correct it. So it's almost 60 to 90 days for somebody's stuff to get corrected, hmm. which could be, you know, rate changing in a mortgage environment. It could be the house is gone now, you can't right. purchase it. 
there's many things and it's very costly for the customer to get that stuff done so I think and you have to know how to do it to maneuver through that that that's a difficult thing to happen so as a community bank I don't know I've helped many people maneuver through those credit issues trying to get those corrected do others have that experience as well are you are you helping uh, your applicants process disputes with other furnishers we have the we help them to try to like what she said is resolve some of the issue but sometimes you're dealing with all this credit bureau you are not dealing with any person mm -hmm. so I think on the other side of the fence I think there has to be more regulation on the other side of the fence too because is uh, if you try to help them they basically they ignore you sometimes I mean if I, if I go back to Ten years ago, when we tried to form a bank, they don't even allow us to be part of the system to pull our customer credit report for about three months. So, so I think on the other side of the industry is that their regulators have to be more systematic in such a way that so that so much of a consumer is depending on the credit score. And there should be a streamlined system in all the credit bureau so that everybody is looking at the same thing. You know, like you, you can have uh, go to a, a shop, you do not know what credit score, which, which bureau they pull. So it may be a different score from three different credit bureaus. Mm. Some using one, some use three, some one. You, you do not know what they are doing. So. We do not know who regulate them, but I think the other side of the <laughs> the other side of the regulation has to be streamlined too, because we have been regulated all the time, so we rely on the information. And the other thing is that uh, for SBA loan, small business administration loan, you are required to pull the guarantor credit report right now, and I think. SBA is requiring us to report the guarantor of the loan going forward. So it will show up if you have a small business administration loan going forward. If you are a guarantor of the loan, it will show up in your credit report Got going it. forward. So it's, it's, it's in the work right now. So it's going to affect a lot of uh, borrower out there if the information is not accurate. You asked about um, us helping cons um, con customers straighten out problems with other furnishers. I think that that is probably a pretty common occurrence because we talked um, initially a lot about our relationships and what I find is that when our customers get entangled in a process that they can't get through, and they can't get a person, they end up coming to a, a bank like ours and say, can you help me with this? Can you point me in the right direction? What should I do to fix this? And like um, Angela said, when it's a customer and you've had them for a long time and you know how tangled the mess is, you do spend quite a bit of time helping them through that. That's with the credit reporting agencies and also with the check systems reporting agencies as well. Great, very, very great discussion. I want to thank everyone uh, for what has been a very productive and informative discussion this afternoon. Uh, this does conclude our Community Bank Advisory Council meeting, and I'd like to invite everyone to have a great day. Thank you very much.